Well, we started off our first session here uh, with collecting questions that, and expectations that you have from the network. And that's where we want to go back now to our list. So what we're going to do now is we're um, just going to go through the question you had in the beginning. And then if you think, yeah, we've done that, we can tick them off. But we do want to do like a group chip in to the questions that haven't been tackled yet. The first one was, um, how can we escape church culture? Um, do we feel we've begun to think about addressing this? I mean, I have a few ideas here we could chip in. I think it's really important that we... Um, many of us are involved in ministries or involved in volunteering and we can get quite caught up in the ministry world and lots of meetings during the week. And it's really, really important that we don't operate with a spiritual and secular divide where we value just the spiritual world and we don't really take our bodies and health and hobbies and other things seriously. One of the number one challenges I've given to the sort of 400, 500 people who have come through Ocker over the last 15 years or so, one of the number one challenges I felt they, they've needed to think about has been, what are your hobbies outside of evangelism? And are you really developing them? Um, sometimes we think we've got to save the world and we neglect hobbies and sport and health and building friendships. And I think what can happen then is church culture becomes so big and becomes the main thing and we, we don't know any friends. So one encouragement here is to live whole and to live human lives and to have hobbies and to have friendships and to um, sports and interests are great ways of meeting people who are not yet trusting Jesus. And um, I was just um, a week ago hanging out with some friends on a farm and we were just cooking some burgers um, and um, chatting about life. And as I gave an illustration from that earlier this week. And I think also what Claire was saying, asking good questions is something that is really helpful to learn in evangelism, to become not only people who can preach the gospel in 90 minutes, which is amazing, but also to learn how to ask good questions. Someone said at the back, in my culture, people don't ask questions. That's the same in my culture. So let us be the, the people who ask the question. And then the question can be a gift for someone. Uh, it can be like a hook. Um, so I was talking about identity at the university and saying how we often ground identity in relationship and then how every relationship is somehow unstable and, um, and how we therefore, I think, need the unconditional, stable love of God to ground our identity. And there was a student coming to me afterwards and she said, um, well, I liked your talk, everything about it, until you start speaking about God because I find, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I find identity in the relationships I have. Uh, so she was quite angry at me, actually, <laughs> for proposing we would need God. And then, um, and then I said, well, that's great. Uh, well, congratulations for having these amazing friendships and, and relationships. But what about someone who doesn't have that ability, who doesn't have those kind of relationships? And then she said, well, they can still develop those those." Um, those relationships. And I said, well, but, that, but then isn't that just a, a value that you, you might achieve if you, if you have an identity you might achieve if you develop those kind of relationships? And what about people who for some reason, maybe because they have disabilities or whatever, can't develop those kind of relationships? What about their value? What about their identity? She didn't have an answer to this. Uh, that was the end of our conversation. I went home thinking, oh, I should have, you know, said this and this and <laughs> preached and ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Another one of those conversations where you go home like, oh, I should have. Oh. Uh, two, two weeks later, her friend calls me, the, the um, Christian girl who brought her to this event, and said, um, you know what, Julia, my friend has now decided to read the Bible with me because that question you asked her stayed with her and she didn't find an answer and she's been pondering that question. So now she's open to read the Bible with me. 
So sometimes a question can be a real gift because it's got a hook and then, um, and then it, it stays with people. Maybe we might want to say, instead of the word quickly, we could say meaningfully, carefully, maybe deeply um, in, in, in a way. I want to add another element to our conversation, which is it, it is really important to listen to where somebody is and to ask appropriate questions and to bring in our testimony and story. But there's also this theme in scripture of God interrupting people and breaking into their world. And so I've, for many years, I, I, I've sometimes offered to pray with people who are not yet Christians. And so I want to introduce that element as well into your thinking about this. And this can actually bring us quite quickly to the question of how can we introduce people not to the gospel as an idea, but God as a person in Jesus. Because we, when you pray with somebody, you're, you're putting your arm around them and you're saying, come and look at my relationship with God that I have. Come and let me share with you a glimpse of the intimacy and the closeness I have with God. And that is actually what Jesus was doing when he taught his disciples how to pray. When he said, our Father, and he taught them the prayer. He took them into the intimacy of God. And so we're not just simply saying, how can we tell people the gospel? I think we can introduce people to an experience of the intimacy with God. And now, um, this might be the right point to just describe how we might go about leading somebody to the Lord Jesus if that opportunity arrives. It has to be done at the right moment. I think there always should be the option for them to say no. I think we should say to them, look, is there anything stopping you? giving your life to Jesus at this moment? Um, do you understand what it might mean to give yourself to Jesus? And crucially, it's important that they understand that there is a vertical dimension to their moral situation. So it's important that they don't just feel sad about how sin has affected them and their heart, but they also need to realize that there's a completely holy and pure God who is utterly just and pure, and we need forgiveness not just from horizontally from people or from ourselves, but we need forgiveness from God. And actually forgiveness from God is the thing that enables us to forgive ourselves and to forgive other people. So I sometimes like to guide people at this point to a passage of scripture. And this is just after Peter has preached the gospel to a number of people who have been asking, what is it you're preaching? What is it you're saying? And he is immediately, sorry, I'll tell you the verse in a second. Um, he's immediately um, in the situation where they say to him, so it's Acts chapter 2, verse 37. So he's just declared, he's brought them through scriptures and prophecies, and he's brought them to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So then they said, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. They were receiving the truth, the revelation. They were receiving the gospel. They're saying this is right. This is true. This is of God. This is reality. What should we do? And Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So, and then he goes on to plead with them further that they might respond to Christ. So a couple of things to notice. They recognize that Jesus is from God. They recognize that they need to repent to God, they recognize there needs to be a public aspect to their confession of Christ, the baptism, which means also joining a church, a, a, a living local church where there's the Bible being taught and then being filled and receiving the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, being born again. So these are the elements that I will lead people through. And I find when I'm leading somebody to Christ, it can be confidence building in them to just open this passage of scripture and say, here are the steps that the first followers of Jesus took and you can take those same steps and so then I leave them then with their nose at the beginning of their Christian journey in scripture 
And then you can just simply pray with them. Um, Lord, I, and I pray with them. I, I've become a Christian a few times um, in, in praying with people, and it really meant it. So my prayer, very simply, when I came to Christ was, Lord, I think you're there. I think you're holy. I think you've revealed yourself in Jesus. Will you forgive me? I'm un impure and unclean. Will you make me clean? And I just lead people through the prayer I prayed because it's got the different elements in there. I want to follow you. I want to know you. So could I encourage you to, um, if you don't already, when you hear a non-believer or when you hear somebody expressing a need, do think about whether this might be an opportunity to pray. I'll tell you something, if, you, if you've been doing this already, um, you'll find that about a third of the people that you offer to pray with may well have a, quite a strong emotional reaction. That they, they may cry. Just be prepared for that because it's very moving for them to encounter God's intimacy. I've never, ever had somebody say no. And I've offered hundreds of people to pray with them. Sometimes they've said, uh, that was a bit weird afterwards, but usually if I don't go too long and too hard, then it's okay. They usually are very, very touched. Okay, so I just thought, touch on that. Okay, great. Um, so can we tick that one off for now? Um, how, what outreach tools work? How have we gone about answering that? What have you seen? Well, there was some um, sort of idea of street tools through the Steiger resources. If you go on their website, there's an amazing PDF of street evangelism tools. Um, we've had using the Bible and the Bible app. We've had engaging with the things people are thinking about and the questions people are asking. And I think this is connected to this, isn't it? So I've also got something else I'm going to offer, which is I've got a, something called a menu, um, and it's, it's a menu of different evangelistic um, possibilities. Things like events, supper parties, um, public evangelism, drama-based evangelism, youth sort of types of events. And I'm very, very happy to email that to everybody on the network. Um, very, very happy. It's actually something I largely cannibalized from um, Michael Green. And so it was some wonderful ideas in there of mission ideas that really work. But I dare say you've got some good ideas too. So um, if you have ideas for mission, then come and feed a few through, uh, through to us. And um, maybe we can add them to the menu and we can all benefit from it as well. But would you like to, I mean, it would probably occupy the rest of our session if we were to name different models and different ideas for mission. But I I think there we've got some ways forward of learning about ideas, but often it's very individual. What works in one context and one situation needs to be explored, and it's the confidence and the encouragement to have a go and to try something that often is, is needed. How to engage with people who are not very interested? Well, I think we've seen some tools, like finding out where they are, finding out what their interest is, what their questions are. Awesome. Um, how to stay passionate. Yeah, good, excellent. And, and sometimes the things that can, can, can sort of push us to silence or losing our excitement about evangelism, by having some time and some training, actually you say, let's talk about this stuff together, let's encourage each other, let's pray, let's get some input and some training. And the, the fear recedes a bit, doesn't it? It doesn't go completely, but it, it actually helps to get some training. Um, and I guess the, the bigger picture as well is, standing in the auditorium, worshiping with other believers, praising God and hearing the word of God taught to us from people from all over the world, we get even more confident and excited. This is actually real. God, you, you're really working. You're still active. You're still moving. That's also something that fires my heart up. Different people at different stages. Yes. Um, and we've used, we've sort of turned to all sorts of tools, haven't we? Maybe, maybe sort of we, we introduced the Bible. Maybe we would introduce engaging with their questions. Maybe we'd introduce walking with somebody in relationships. I think we've, 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 the fundamental thing here is that treating people as individuals. And I think every single session has emphasized that. It's been one of our core values is people are different. They're at different stages. Awesome. Um, how much to share and when? I think we've talked about that a little bit in our discussion here, and the sensitivity and the listening assumes that we're going to share what's appropriate. We're depending on God as we share. We're wanting to share our story and our testimony. We're wanting to offer to prayer sometimes, pray sometimes. How to introduce people to Jesus. 
real versus um, expect, real experience and expectations and relationships. Well, I think some of my comments about prayer and, and introducing people to just basic intimacy with Jesus. I, I prefer to encourage people down that route of just humble, repentant prayer than promising that something might happen in a worship service or might happen when when, when some other sort of situation occurs. As much as we might find those things a blessing in our Christian life, I know that if I bring somebody to the Lord and I say, look, if you repent of your sins, and if you open your heart and you ask God for forgiveness, if you really repent and you really ask God for forgiveness, you will meet him. And he promises that he will meet you there. I don't think actually we're empowered by scripture to offer much more experience than that basic diet of repentance and faith and the joy of knowing that relationship. And I think there is a bit of a danger of over-promising experience sometimes, um, something I've seen a lot of people feeling let down by. Um, so I would prefer to, to offer just the basic humility of a relationship with God. There is um, there's quite an interesting one because obviously, as we all talked about, postmodernity or postmodern people are prone to, they, they want experience. So the way to truth for them is through experience. And it's amazing because we have a God who's relational. So um, I know some people in Germany have a de developed sort of a tool of evangelism <laughs> um, for a church to just open their doors for, say, a week. And people can come in and they've got these little prayer corners. So, um, for example, you can... Um, you can write down something that's on on your heart and then you can stick it into your wall and they've got these little stones. Or you can light a candle. My city is very Catholic, so that works well with them. But then you can say, well, you know, maybe you want to say a little prayer with this. So um, so there, there, you can have a lot of creativity and just oh, if you have a church that is sort of maybe in the middle of town or something, just do like an open church week or something like that where people can really experience and then maybe have a few people there um, and you can say, well, if you, know, if you went through some of these different stations or different experience rooms, however you call them, and you want to talk to someone afterwards, here is someone. So that might be something, um, obviously, you can't do that on your own. <laughs> we need to do it in community. And that's what we've tried to, for a short temporary time, in these moments, in these mornings together, we've tried to say, isn't it great to be part of a team? Isn't it great to, to, to actually be talking about these things and encouraging each other together? Um, if you work more on your own, maybe there's a way you could build a team of people who would um, encourage you, pray for you, even if they're not um, as involved in evangelism and thinking about evangelism as you are, maybe just having people who pray for you and you can share ups and downs with them. That's a really good thing to have around you. The Apostle Paul, when he arrived in Athens, was actually waiting for his team to arrive. And he kept getting into riots and things, so he had to keep moving on. But he worked in a team, um, and maybe that's a pattern for us.